Now, in the future, like you were talking about, Dr. McCoy in the old Star Trek series, oh, yeah. he had all these fancy gadgets. and Tricorder! Yeah, what, what do you think te uh, technologies like that, medicines and things like that, are uh, more the technology, well, what do you think will happen in the future? Okay, so that's a, that's a particularly good example because oftentimes the government in one guise or another wants us to make a tricorder. That, that, that piece of history, that piece of science fiction history has had a greater impact than I think its originators ever knew. And so I've actually participated in programs where nominally the idea was we're, you, you're supposed to make us a tricorder. And as a researcher in such a program, we often try and tell people, you know, we, we can't really do that. It, there is no way, there is no mechanism, no physical way I know of to point something at you and know a lot about your molecules, right? It, it's, it's a very difficult problem. I can see what, you know, I can see what you look like. I can maybe know a little about your heart rate. I could know that you're breathing. There's lots of things I could know about you from afar. But knowing what your molecules are doing is not one of those things. So that's actually a great example because it's the one thing that people clue in on and say, wow, if we could just have that. And it's, as a researcher, it's the thing, that's the one thing I can't give you because I just can't. I don't know a physical method whereby I can probe your molecules from way over here and know what's going on, which is why I need to get access to urine or saliva or blood or something like that. Now, given that we can't make a tricorder, at least the way the ones that worked on Star Trek work, I do think we're going to be able to move towards a future where diagnostics will be a much greater part of our everyday life, whether we use them in the form of little kits that we can buy or get virtually for free, or whether they're just part and parcel of everything. So you can imagine, you know, and again, whether you want view this as a utopia or a dystopia is up to you, that, that, that little sensors are part of every food you eat. And that they, you know, if you happen to have cancer, um, you know, you pee green, as it were. You know, it's like, oh, there's green in my urine, I must have cancer, right? Now, you know... How funny. Right? So, because again, the diagnostics could go through you, assess what's going on in you, and deliver a signal. It doesn't have to be green urine, it could just be, you know, I'll save this, I'll take it to my doctor, and my doctor will read out, you know, you have this, 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 and this, get to work on the treadmill, oh my gosh, you're kidding, you're smoking again, you know, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, it, it could be a, a big range of diagnostics from things that you introduce into yourself and that monitor you as they as they go through. Would there be a problem with them like piling up and you getting a lot of metal in you? These tiny little tiny tiny little molecules. So these are things that probably are utterly biodegradable. They're probably the same type of molecules that they're measuring, they are themselves. And so probably if you put in let's say a million sensors, 900,000 of them get degraded before they even get out the other end and then 100,000 that get out tell tell you something about you. Wow. You can think it would I was thinking when you said sensor it'd be a big capsule that we would have to eat and... No, I mean, I think that would be unpl A, unpleasant, and, and B, um, again, we're, we're, you, you allowed me some science fiction latitude there. We, you know, if I had to make something like that absolutely today, that might be what I would make or something akin to it. But nobody would use it and nobody would buy it and, and it would just be silly. But into the future, I can imagine miniaturization of such sensors to the size of individual molecules or individual bacteria or individual cells and learning a lot from each one of them, each one acting in parallel to assess different aspects of your condition and then read them out as a group at the end. So it's, it's the same idea except instead of metal in a capsule, it's now shrunken down to a cell or a molecule and you have many of them working in parallel. Wow, the technology needed for that is amazing. It, but it's the same technology we've been talking about. Cellular engineering, manipulation of DNA, trying to use evolution to create better therapeutics, better diagnostics. It, it, it all goes back to your original question, which underpins, you know, your excellent, you know, interview and attempt to educate yourself, which is, hey, how does this stuff work? Now, do you know any Kickstarter or crowdfunded projects? No, because um, I don't want to disappoint people, basically. The government funds me, and that's great, and I try and give the government back as much as they funded for. If I went to a Kickstarter or crowdsource route, what I'd be doing was promising people a particular thing. And I may do that at some point, not so much for the money, but because I really would like to know what people want. I think people should have a great say, not just in their healthcare and their diagnostics, but in research as a whole. But I haven't yet done that because mostly I feel like it would, it would come off more like a scam than like a sincere effort to, to, to improve human health. 
So I'm waiting for a more specific problem that I would really like to interface with people on and say, what would you like me to do and what will, how will this benefit your life? Wonderful. It's like a good work. Yeah. It really is. Now, I want to thank you so much for this interview. Absolutely. It was fun. And I want to ask one final question. Sure. I was watching a video that you play video games with your sons. Yes, absolutely. And I got to ask, what's your favorite? Oh, I mean, the, um, um, Skyrim, by, by far. I've heard of that. I've, I've never played that. Skyrim's a lot of fun. But I've heard of that. That's my favorite video game. And then just for non, you know, uh, graf graphic engine driven, I like I like Civilization Three. So... I love Civ. I love Civ. Civ, Civ 3. Civ. Can't, go, can't go Civ 4 or Civ 5, but Civ 3, my boys and I still play Civ 3 all the day. Now, is that Beyond the Sword? Uh, is that called that one? I don't know. Civ, Civ 3, Civ, I mean, the Civ series is, is, a very, is a very structured set of games, and they overdid it when they went beyond Civ 3. Civ 3 is the, the it's, it's, sort of like, it's sort of like global chess. I think of it like global chess. I like, is that the one that has Baba Yat too? As the song. No, I don't think so. I don't okay. think so. I think we're thinking of something different. Maybe I've been playing Civ Four. So maybe I got to. Could, go could back be. You could. That's right. You could. You could be beyond the one. The one I'm on. I gotta go back to Civ Three because okay. I'm sure that's the best one. Well, I just that's just my. Favorite. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ben. Great. Very kind. Thank I you very much. I learned so much.